Hi, I'm Annie Leonard with the story of Stuff. Welcome to another episode of The Good Stuff, where we talk with people who are working on solutions to the take-make-waste system that's trashing the planet, threatening our communities, and harming our health. People always ask me how I stay optimistic in the face of so much bad news about the environment. Easy. I stop, take a break from discussions of doomsday, and look around me at all the great things being done by people working to make the situation better. It doesn't make the very real problems we're facing go away, but it gives me hope and inspiration to keep fighting the good fight. One of my greatest sources of inspiration is the Brower Youth Awards. They're named after the late David Brower, the father of the American environmental movement and founder of Earth Island Institute. In his honor, every year Earth Island takes nominations of young people from around North America who are making a difference for the environment. They pick six winners— like Madison and Rhiannon, the Girl Scouts we interviewed a few episodes back who are campaigning to protect orangutan whose habitat is threatened by palm oil plantations. The winners are announced at an award ceremony that is among the most inspiring events of my year. I can't tell you how many times I've teared up hearing these brave young people talk about their passion for saving the planet. Today, we'll talk with two more Brower Youth Award honorees. Both of them saw tremendous waste on their college campuses and set out to do something about it. Both of their stories are not only inspiring, but hold valuable lessons for the rest of us about how to work for change. I'm excited, so let's go. I've never understood cynics who say that today's college students are apathetic. Sure, in the 60s, college campuses were at the core of the movements for civil rights and to stop the Vietnam War. But in the decade since, college students have remained passionate and active on many fronts. The campaign to get colleges and universities to divest their finances from investments in South Africa was a crucial part of the movement to end apartheid. Today, they're involved in campaigns to protect the rights of immigrants or a woman's right to choose. And of course, they're concerned about the environment, from fossil fuel divestment to waste right on their campuses, like today's guests. First, we'll talk with Alex Freed. He was a student at the University of New Hampshire when he noticed that at the end of each spring semester, as students cleared out their dorm rooms and apartments to head out for the summer, they left behind a mountain of stuff. Not just trash, but perfectly good couches, electronics, and appliances galore. Why, he wondered, can't all that stuff be reused? So he did something about it. Alex, welcome to The Good Stuff. Glad to be here. When most people think of waste, they think of, you know, big stinking dumps or giant factories. They don't usually think of beautiful college campuses. What's what's the waste issue on college campuses? When students move out at the end of the year, um, when they're heading home for the summer, uh, they're in a place of turmoil. So they're they're either graduating and they're going off to start their lives or they're moving into different apartments or they're moving back home for the summer to have a summer job. Um, But there's a lot of movement, a lot of turmoil, and it's usually at a really hectic time in their lives. So they've just finished finals. They've been through a lot of stress. And then there's all this stuff that they have to deal with, all of the stuff that they've accumulated in their rooms throughout the year. Like what kind of stuff? Uh, Furniture, electronics, clothing, dishware, decorations, school supplies, food, you know, all sorts of pretty much everything that you could imagine that would be in a dorm room winds up usually in a dumpster. So how much stuff is there in all these dumpsters and where does it go? Yeah, so we we did some research and we found that during the average month at UNH, uh, students threw away 25 tons of trash. And in the month of May, when they move out, they throw away 105 tons. So it was 80 extra tons of mostly usable material. We realized that this wasn't a problem that just existed at UNH. There's 2,100 colleges and universities in the country. And that problem exists on every single one of those campuses. So what we did was we set out to try to design a program that would work for our campus, but that could be uh, implemented on other campuses if it worked for our campus. So our idea was to collect the stuff that students threw away that was usable, to find a way to store it, and then to hold a big sale and sell it all back. And how did it go? It was great. So, um, you know, it was a a lot of work. Uh, We faced a lot of uphill battles. We were designing a program that had really never been done before, run by students. And um, we had a lot of work to do to kind of prove ourselves to the UNH administration and to allow them to give us a responsibility to do the program. And so when you go into that system of mostly administrators, mostly people who um, have been hired to do you know, what they do best for uh, years and years and years, it can be difficult to ask them to change and, and specifically to ask them to give students the responsibility in that change. And so um, 
a lot of the uphill battles that we faced were convincing the UNH administration to allow us to do certain aspects of the program and uh, to think differently about the issues that we were presenting. So um, some of the issues were the, you know, whether or not we were violating fire code when we were allowing for students to leave materials in you know, front lobbies or other drop-off locations because you'd have the buildup of couches and other materials and they were concerned about you know, fire code issues, blocking exits and things like that. When I imagine a, a dormitory lobby full of couches, I realize how much perspective makes a difference because some people could see that as a huge problem and a yeah, waste, right. and some people could see it as a pile of resources and an opportunity. I once heard the definition that waste is resources in the wrong place. Yeah. When the only solution is a dumpster, everything looks like trash. And so, you know, when students are moving out and if the only solution that they have is a dumpster, then it's all going to go in the dumpster. And if there are other... Uh, resources or avenues available to them, then we should be encouraging them to use that. But I, I don't think that we can necessarily be getting upset with students for throwing items away when they really did not have the opportunity available to not throw them away. I would love to tell the story of our experience with the chief of police because it's a really good story that I think people could benefit yeah. from. We had to get permission to run this program from eight administrations on campus. Um, so it was, you know, housing and residential life and facilities and grounds and roads. And there were all these different, you know, actors in putting this program together. And at the end, we had to get the chief of police to sign our permit. And so we uh, sent the permit to the chief of police and he sent it back with an X and he denied the permit. We asked him uh, why he had denied the permit. And he explained all of his concerns around traffic and parking management of the sale, and we started working out um, solutions through that. At the end, he was, you know, concerned, but he decided that he would sign the permit. He really appreciated the way that we had approached the meeting. And then since then, he's become just this huge ally to us. And then recently, we met with him, and he said that um, he just wanted he wanted to tell us that he was really proud of us for the work that we'd done and, and that the program far exceeded his expectations um, and that he... Uh, wanted to say that working with us had kind of changed the way that he works with students and that he'd been on this campus for 12 years and that um, he now, when he's presented with an idea that he doesn't agree with, he doesn't just outright deny it, but he asks students for a meeting and he tries to find ways to work with them and to present to them what his concerns are because he doesn't ever want to be that kind of barrier that he once was to us in setting up the program. That's a fantastic story. It reminds me of a saying someone told me once, when you're dealing with an opponent, to think about the belief behind the behavior. Because mm. if we just respond to people's frontline position, they dig in their heels more. But if you go behind and figure out what is it that's informing that position, then usually there's a lot of workability around that. So tell me now how you're spreading this to other campuses. So um, – after the success of the first year, and then we significantly expanded the program the second year, we began looking into, you know, a lot of students across the country contacted us and wanted to know how to do the program on their campus. And we began looking into how to spread this program out beyond the Uni University of New Hampshire. So um, what it led to was the creation of a nonprofit that we call PLAN, the Post Landfill Action Network. And PLAN works with students across the country to help them set up these programs. So if there are students listening to this podcast who want to start one of these Move Out Waste Prevention Days, can they contact you? Yeah, absolutely. So they can go to www.postlandfill.org or contact me at alex at postlandfill.org. Great. And we'll also have those links on our website. If you've followed this podcast or our work at the Story of Stuff Project for any time at all, you know that one of the forms of wasteful, unsustainable, and unnecessary stuff that I can't stand is bottled water. It drives me crazy. Why would anyone want to buy water in a throwaway plastic bottle made from oil that ends up by the billions in landfills or as part of the giant floating islands that pollute the oceans and endanger sea creatures? Duh! Not to mention... Bottled water is hundreds of times more expensive than water from your own kitchen sink. Amira Ode, a student at the University of Puerto Rico, felt the same way. So she started a movement that is spreading from her home campus to the rest of the island. Welcome, Amira. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so I found the stories I read about your work incredibly inspiring. I'm wondering if you could just tell me a little bit about what is the main issue that you're working on in Puerto Rico? We're working to ban or at least significantly reduce the sales of bottled water from our campus at the University of Puerto Rico on Rio Piedras campus. And why bottled water? There's no reason for it because we have excellent tap water quality. So 
people really need to start trusting our, our tap water resources instead of buying this commodity that's just poisoning us and poisoning the environment. Well, I'm sure you know that you're not alone. I travel around to speak at probably about 20 or 30 colleges a year, and almost every one of them now has a group of students that are working to ban bottled water. So you're definitely part of a very big and very successful movement. So if the tap water is good, why are people still buying bottled water? People just don't trust um, the tap water quality. It's probably because of the same um, advertising these companies do about uh, saying that tap water is dirty and the look at our bottles come from the glaciers and from the Amazon and from the mountain springs. So all this advertising is what probably makes people not trust our resources and uh, it's something that's been going on for so many years that people actually forgot that we used to drink only tap water all the time and stop at drinking fountains. Right, you probably forgot, but I can remember when we used to drink <laughs> tap water. I can remember when we used to walk around the block without being worried that we wouldn't find a drink halfway around the block. I mean, it is just crazy yeah. now how we think we have to have water with us at all times. Yes. <laughs> But I, when I was younger and we did not drink bottled water, there were a lot more drinking fountains around. And I've noticed drinking fountains are disappearing. And so one of the things we need to do to fight bottled water, as you know, is is bring drinking fountains back. How has that been going on your campus? We uh, had to petition to get new drinking fountains installed because with that same situation of drinking fountains disappearing, the ones that were left on campus were in horrible condition. They had mold, they didn't work, they had hot water, and they were even plugged in, wasting energy even if they weren't working. So we had to petition the administration to install new drinking fountains, even though we've worked a lot on it. We still know that a lot of people know about this issue, but they are still buying the product. They don't feel like they need to to make a change. They don't feel this sense of urgency. So that's why we want to ban the, the sales because um, sadly not everyone is going to make a, a even if it's a small change in their daily lives, not many people are going to do this. So if your education efforts are working so well and people are really learning about the problems with bottled water, why then do you think so many people are still buying this stuff on your campus? People, well, we are just humans in general are just creatures of of things that we're used to. We wake up every morning and we do the same thing and we go to the same place in our home to get the same piece of clothing or toothbrush or whatever. So we we like to do the same thing. And if people sometimes are confronted with a small change, it's sometimes shocking. Um, so when people that go every morning to the vending machine and buy a bottle of water, when they're confronted with this change, some people are more resistant to, to change than others. And uh, this happens even more when people don't really have a sense of urgency towards taking action. They might know about this problem, but if they feel like, oh, it's going to happen in 500 years, well, then they won't feel the need to, to make a change now. Which it's really like we're creatures of habits. And so yeah. this takes forming new habits. And it is a new habit to, to think about carrying your reusable bag or your reusable bottle. But once you do it, it feels so weird to leave the house without your exactly. reusable bottle. <laughs> Creating the sense of urgency is something really important. And something that worked for me to start working on this and what motivated me to start working on this now was seeing it on a global scale. Thinking that... It's not only me drinking bottled water, but there's 7 billion people in the world. And uh, I heard about the waste of, of these plastic bottles, and I started to think, how many plastic bottles do I need to cross my room? And how would I need to cross the entire world? And that happens every day. 
There are so many problems with bottled water, obviously, from the, the oil that's extracted to make the bottles, from the chemicals that are added to make it into plastic, um, from the waste that's disposed of it, from the in, how much these things cost and the waste of money as well as resources. Of all of these different concerns about bottled water, which one do the students resonate with the most? Which message is the most effective at convincing them they should move away from this habit? The money issue, usually. We can talk to them about pollution, about plastic never really disappearing. We can talk to them about climate change. But when we tell them that a person wastes $200 or more a year on bottled water, then they're like, wow, really? Wow. And the, the most interesting thing happened to me two weeks ago. I was telling these girls um, uh, this about this issue and I told them the, the money issue and she and she went and mentioned wow but I use like five bottles a day and she took out her cell phone and put it in a calculator and said wow this is the money I need to go on an exchange project to Spain and that really shocked her and she went around and told all her friends about how much money she was she was spending on, on these unnecessary products we calculated and uh, each of these spending machines um, wastes around $300 a year in electricity and there are around 30 vending machines on That's campus. Each plastic bottle vending machine uses $300 yeah. worth of electricity yeah. a year? Wow, I can think of better places to put $300 <laughs> in a university. Exactly. So when you are, tell me about all of these events and different activities people can do, your whole face just lights up and you have this huge <laughs> smile. Um, and it makes me realize that this is not a chore. This is not a burden or a drag to do this kind of work. It sounds like it's really fun. Yeah, indeed. It's uh, It's been my passion since I can remember to work in environmental protection. So organizing all these events is really no no burden. inspired by Alex and Amira as I am? Great! But if we want to move from inspiration to action, what lessons can we learn from their work? I can think of at least three. First, start close to home. Maybe you can't sail on a Greenpeace ship to protest drilling in the Arctic or force the global palm oil industry to stop cutting down rainforests. But if you look around, you'll see plenty of opportunities to make change in your own community. Maybe it's starting a petition to ban plastic bags at the supermarket or install bike racks downtown. Start small, take it one step at a time, and build your citizen muscle for bigger challenges. Second, enlist others. Two heads are better than one, and so are three, 33, or 300. Don't try to do it all yourself. One of the great side benefits of working for change is that it necessitates getting to know our neighbors and seeking out allies in unlikely places. Third, don't give up. It took Amira almost a year just to get a meeting with the school chancellor to talk about a bottled water ban. Alex had to deal with one campus bureaucracy after another before he got permission to hold his first start-of-school yard sale. And changing business as usual is never easy. On our website, storyofstuff.org, you'll find links to learn more about Alex's and Amira's work. We'll also post some links to videos from the Brower Youth Awards to help inspire you even more. That's it for this episode of The Good Stuff. Our show comes to you from the studios of Youth Radio in Oakland, California. Our engineer is James Rowland. The Good Stuff is produced by Bill Walker. We'll have another show online in a few weeks. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Find us on Facebook and storyofstuff.org and keep working on the good stuff in your own community. Thanks for being part of the solution.